Good morning, everyone. And welcome to St. John the Evangelist Parish as we celebrate the third Sunday of Easter. Our grief group meets this week. That's on Wednesday, April 17th at 1 p.m. And they'd like you to know that new members are always welcome. And if you'd like to host the rescue project at your home this spring or summer, or if you'd like to attend the rescue project as part of a small group gathering, please contact me or Todd at the parish office or after mass today. And you've probably heard um, that we have a mass time survey. Um, what will happen is Father will explain that at the end of mass. That's for the local Jackson area, the deanery. And um, there will be paper copies available after Mass in the vestibules. Um, but our preferred way is the digital survey, if you can take it that way. So again, Father will explain more after Mass. And today we'll be taking a look at Bishop's 44th Challenge on the road to Emmaus. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let's start this week on the road to Emmaus with a question. What is the most famous prayer in the world? It has to be the Our Father. There have been many commentaries written on these words, which were given to us by Jesus. Many of us recite this divinely ordained prayer every day. We certainly pray it at every Mass before our reception of Holy Communion said here at this point in the Mass, three things are important for us to examine. That we say, Our Father, that we pray for the kingdom to come, and that we pray for our daily bread. It is almost incredible to think that we can call God by such a familiar term such as Dad. But that is the word that Jesus has told us to put on our lips, Abba, Father. God, any God, is supposed to be far from us not really care about us. And certainly, we are not to be so presumptuous as to call him Dad, Abba. This kind of loving, close, intimate relationship which Jesus has with the Father has been given to us. What has been the very nature of the life of the Trinity, a life of perfect love, is now ours for the asking. That is why praying these words is the perfect start for communion, Holy Communion. We have been invited into the most sacred communion of the blessed Trinity, into perfect love. Jesus, our brother, has opened the way into that life by letting us become sons and daughters to his Father. As a manifestation of our communion with the Trinity, of our union with the Father, we pray that his kingdom may come. The third century Christian scholar, Origen of Alexandria, writing on prayer noted, Thus it is clear that he who prays for the coming of God's kingdom prays rightly to have it within himself, that there it may grow and bear fruit and become perfect. For God reigns in each of his holy ones. We are not just praying that the kingdom of God will come somewhere out there. Rather, it is to be in us. Jesus at the Last Supper responded to one of the apostles, Whoever loves me will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. This is the nature of communion with God. We are changed by the very presence of God within us. The entire Mass celebrates that presence, which began with our baptism. Finally, we pray for daily bread. Most likely, this originally referred to our actual daily sustenance. However, it did not take long at all to see it as a reference to the daily Eucharist. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, in his fourth century catechetical teachings on the Our Father, proclaimed, This common bread is not substantial bread, but this holy bread is substantial, that is, appointed for the substance of the soul. For this bread goes not into the belly and is cast out into the draught, but is distributed into your whole system for the benefit of body and soul. By praying these words of Jesus, 
We are now preparing ourselves for a yet deeper communion, that with the very body and blood of the Savior. Immediately after our common prayer, the priest adds that we be delivered from evil and sin and distress. This is so that we will be, in fact, worthy of our communion with the Father and with the Son and with the Holy Spirit, as well as our communion with one another. It is Christ who willingly and joyfully gives us freedom from our sins if we but turn to him. The priest's words are a summons to us to allow ourselves to be prepared for that deepest communion of all. And now to our weekly challenge. As we've just been exploring, the daily bread of the Our Father has always been connected to the Holy Eucharist. Hence, this week, I'm challenging you to extend the Eucharistic fast prior to receiving Holy Communion. At present, we are only required to fast for one hour before Holy Communion. So why not make it one hour prior to the beginning of Holy Mass, or for even longer? Now don't get mad, don't harm your health, but do consider doing even a little bit more out of love for Abba, our Father. Until we meet again on the road to Emmaus, God love you all. We thank Bishop for another great challenge this week. And um, just a few more things as we begin. Um, we do have a few flowers that did not survive a second week, so they are over in the corner here by the cry room if you'd like to take one after Mass. And also after Mass, our Hope and Healing prayer team is available, um, as usual, up here on the St. Joseph's side altar, if you'd like to receive prayer for yourself or for a loved one. As we prepare our hearts and minds to enter into Mass now, we ask that you, you please check that your cell phones are silenced, and we invite you to join us on today's antiphons, which can be found in Source and Summit on page 296. At this liturgy, we pray especially for Leon Ben, third anniversary, and Steve Ben. Please rise and join in our entrance antiphon found along with the readings on page 296 of your Source and Summit Missal. Cry out with joy to God of the earth. O sing to the glory of his name. O render him glorious praise. Alleluia. Cry out with joy to God of the earth. O sing to the glory of his name. O render him glorious praise. of your strength, your enemies fall upon you. Before you all the earth shall bow down, shall sing to you, sing to your name.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. A continued happy Easter to everyone on this third Sunday of the Easter season. Let us take a moment now to uh, acknowledge our sins so as to prepare ourselves for these sacred mysteries. Lord Jesus, you raise the dead to life in the spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you forgive us our sins. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you feed us with your body and your blood. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Glory to God in the highest, and, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord and Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the Let us pray. May your people exalt forever, O God, in renewed youthfulness of spirit, so that rejoicing now in the restored glory of our adoption, we may look forward in confident hope to the rejoicing of the day of resurrection. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. All right, we, at the, this liturgy, we have the children's liturgy of the Word, so any children ages four years old up to fifth grade are invited to come forward at this time. Oh, we got to get the lectionary here. Please stand at the foot of the sanctuary facing the altar and the tabernacle. Receive the book of readings and proclaim God's word faithfully to the children entrusted to your care. Go now and listen to God's word and reflect on the wonderful things God has done for us until you return for the liturgy of the Eucharist. And I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And for our Liturgy of the Word, we continue to have uh, readings from, and the first reading, instead of coming from the Old Testament throughout the Easter season, we have them come from the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament because it shows how the life of the church and its leaders uh, and its faithful reflect the life of Jesus himself. We are the ones who continue Jesus' ministry of proclamation of the good news to the world. And the, the second reading is about what it means to truly know God. There's a little test that, uh, at, that our patron, St. John, in his epistle, asks of whether we truly know God or not. And then in the gospel, we, of course, continue with the resurrection appearances. Let's listen to the life-giving word of God.
a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter said to the people, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence when he had decided to release him. You denied the holy and righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you, the author of life you put to death. But God raised him from the dead. Of this we are a witness. Now I know, brothers, that you acted out of ignorance, just as our leaders did. But God has thus brought to fulfillment what he had announced beforehand through the mouths of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be wiped away. The word of the Lord. Let your face shine on us. Lord, let your face shine on us. When I call, answer me, O oh my just God, you who relieve me when I am in distress. Have pity on me and hear my prayer. Lord, let your face shine on us. Know that the Lord does wonders for his faithful one. The Lord will hear me when I call upon him. Lord, let your face shine on us. Let the light of your countenance shine upon us. You put gladness into my heart. Lord, let your face shine on us. As soon as I lay down, I fall peacefully asleep. For you alone, O oh Lord, Bring security to my dwelling. Lord, let your face shine on us. A reading from the first letter of St. John. My children, I am writing this to you so that you may not commit sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is expiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for those of the whole world. The way we may be sure that we know him is to keep his commandments. Those who say, I know him, but do not keep his commandments are liars, and the truth is not in them. But whoever keeps his word, the love of God is truly perfected in him the word of the Lord. Hey. 
Lord Jesus, open the scriptures to us. Make our hearts burn while you speak to us. be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The two disciples recounted what had taken place on the way and how Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. While they were still speaking about this, he stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. But they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. Then he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do questions arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you can see I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they were still incredulous for joy and were amazed, he asked them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish, and he took it, and he ate it in front of them. He said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, Jesus uh, wants to show them he's not a ghost, right? That he is risen from the dead in, bodily, in full bodily form, right? A ghost doesn't uh, have a digestive system, right? He proves that it's really him. You're not seeing hallucinations. I'm going to eat this piece of fish just to make you understand it's really me. And touch me. I got, I got these wounds. And, uh, and so... Uh, he wants to impress upon them that it is a bodily resurrection. Uh, and so, but before uh, I go into the rest of the readings, I want to start out with uh, something that happened to me just this Thursday and Friday. Uh, Father Brian had mentioned to you back in November how going to a Ben Rector concert was a bucket list item for him uh, last year that he was delighted to have experienced. Well, as you know, I love golf. And I was delighted to check off a bucket list just this past Thursday and Friday. Uh, on Wednesday evening, I arrived at Augusta, Georgia, and I got to experience the Masters. And on the flight over there, I actually ran into fel two fellow Jacksonians, uh, Bart Hawley and his son Andy. Um, but uh, I joined some friends over there who rented a house about 20 minutes drive from Augusta National. Uh, and just walking on that course onto the grounds, right? As they show on TV, the grounds were just spectacular and pristine with every detail attended to. And the course is actually even more majestic than what we see on TV because a two-dimensional screen simply can't capture how hilly uh, the landscape is. My feet, man, I mean, after walking over 21,000 steps in one day, right? This is nearly 10 miles on that first day's those puppies were barking. I mean, whew. Uh, but on Thursday morning, I was just determined to walk the entire course from number one to number 18 sequentially, following three groups in particular play those holes. The first group uh, I was following had the defending Masters champion, John Rahm, who had, you know, won last year with a nice touch after the at the end of the trophy presentation, he wished everybody happy Easter and then did a sign of the cross and pointed uh, up to the skies, to the heavens. The group after them, after John Rahm's group, was 
uh, had both Rory McIlroy and Scotty Scheffler, who won it the year before John Rahm in 2022. And Scotty, having won back-to-back -to -back tournaments recently, uh, nearly a third in a row, is the clear odds-on favorite to win this year, even before he got the lead uh, yesterday. But the reason why, uh, the solo lead, I should say, but the reason why I bring up the Masters is because I want to focus on some comments that uh, Scotty made at the Masters press conference. You know, he's become a crowd favorite uh, uh, because he's such a modest guy, humble guy, ordinary guy for being the number one golfer in the world, right? And so the reporter asked, you know, he was talking, the reporter was talking to his dad and his dad was saying that he's just so glad Scotty's a good person. And he said, that's kind of what I really wanted out of our relationship. And so the reporter was like, I'm kind of curious if you could share uh, what lessons did he impart when you were a kid uh, to make sure that you weren't, you know, a jerk. <laughs> that's what the reporter said, <laughs> that you weren't dismissive of, per of people. I think that's a pretty fair assessment of how you treat others. And Scotty replied, well, I think, you know, my dad he never looked at me as a golfer. He never pushed me to become a good golfer. That was never what he wanted for me. I think playing junior golf, sometimes you see a lot of parents who really want their kid to be really, really good at something, and they think that that's going to bring them joy. But becoming a really good golfer may bring you a little bit of momentary joy, but it doesn't, didn't, doesn't, sustain, it doesn't sustain it for very long. Winning a tournament makes me happy for about five minutes. And so the reporter says, well, how, uh, where does it fit in? Uh, how does golf fit in in defining you as a person right now? And Scotty said, I'm hoping it doesn't define me too much because I feel like, and I say this a bunch, golf's something that I do. Yeah, it's a huge part of my life, but it doesn't define me as a person. It's just something I do, and I happen to be good at it some weeks. And so the reporter followed up that question and said, what do you think defines you? And Scotty jokingly says, ask my wife. But, uh, but then he says simply, you know, I'm a faithful guy. I believe in a creator. I believe in Jesus. Ultimately, that's what defines me the most. And then he wraps it up pretty plainly. Uh, yeah, I feel like I've been given a platform to compete and show my talent, but I think what defines me most is my faith. I've been called to come out here, do my best, and glorify God. And that's pretty much it. Right? Been called to glorify God, that's pretty much it. So Scotty seems to have his priorities in order, right? In fact, one of the questions he was asked the last couple of days because his wife Meredith is due to give birth to a child soon. And so he was asked, in the event that you have the lead on Sunday, which he does, uh, but your wife was ready to give birth, would you leave? And a couple of days ago he said, I'm ready at any moment's notice. And people couldn't believe it, so he asked, they kept on asking. And then he said, right after his great round on Saturday, he said, and uh, getting the outright lead, he said, right now, the most exciting thing for us is not winning the Masters. It's a baby coming pretty soon. So what if you were the number one golfer in the world? With all the eyes of the golfing world upon you this week and its most prestigious tournament, and you were asked, what do you think defines you? Do you have that, that answer to that question? What do you think defines you? Would you be, uh, in, your, in your relationship with God, would you be able to be able to say something like Scotty said, I believe in Jesus. Ultimately, I think that's what defines me most. I've been called to glorify God, and that's pretty much it. Pretty plain and simple answer, right? It, is God just one thing in your life among many other things like family and work and hobbies and sports and clubs, etc., And all of those things together define you. Or are all those things like family, career, hobbies, sports, all ordered towards the one and only thing we're called to do for all eternity? And that's to glorify God. The answer to that question is huge. Right? And the implications are huge. If God is one among many things in your life, even if he's the most important of those things, or 
if he's the one and only thing, all, and all of your other loves are ordered towards that one love. Those two different options live to totally different lives. What path are you going down? One leads to a life of fragmentation, being pulled in all kinds of different directions, and feeling conflicted because of the competing loyalties in my life. The other leads towards a life of integrity and wholeness and a simplicity that leads to peace because everything is ordered to one thing, loving and glorifying God. There are no competing loyalties so that we love everything else in our life in light of that one love of God. I mean, do you see the wisdom then of the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Doesn't leave much for anything else, does it? Because life is an eternal love affair with God who is madly in love with humanity and madly in love with you specifically. Remember, God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful, so he can love each of us personally with an intensity as if we were the, his only love. So God is madly in love with you, but love takes two to tango. Are you madly in love with God? So that everything you, uh, you in your world, everything in his beautiful creation and everything good, true, and beautiful in your life is an expression of his love for you. I mean, think about ladies, your, the, 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 the married ladies, if you have a diamond ring on your finger, what if that wasn't given to you by your spouse? It was just a, a pretty rock on your finger. Yeah, it's pretty, it's beautiful, it's expensive, <laughs> but it wasn't given to you out of love. It was just something you possess, maybe a personal item or a personal purchase. Yeah, it's nice, but it becomes priceless when it becomes a pledge of your significant other's uh, undying love for you, doesn't it? It takes a totally different significance when you know that this is a gift symbolizing the undying love God or your spouse has for you. Everything else in creation we should see in that light. Yeah, there's a lot of good things around us, but do we recognize that it is expression of God's love for us, his mad love for us, right? The love from your spouse, the love you have for your children, the awe you have from the natural wonders of this world, the majesty of the masters, right? The satisfaction of achieving any achieving excellence in any given field, the thrill of sports or whatever your hobbies are, or the delight of things as simple as good food and drink. As the prophet Isaiah says, juicy rich food and pure choice wines. All of it is meant to be ordered to this eternal love affair with God, who's the source of all of it and has given it to us. Now, loving and glorifying God and this leading to a life of peace doesn't mean it, it can't be hard and difficult, right? They're not mutually exclusive things. Peace in our life and difficult things are not mutually exclusive. In fact, in this world, this fallen world, this side of reality, the most profound love always entails sacrifice and suffering because it entails a dying to self, right? Just look at the symbol of our faith, right? the most profound act of love. But even in that, in, in our suffering, in our sacrifice, the saints can attest there can be a bitter sweetness in that suffering because we're uniting ourselves more closely with our beloved. I mean, look at the difference it made in the lives of Peter and the apostles. You notice a difference in their lives pre-resurrection and post-resurrection, right? Right? Pre-resurrection, Peter denied Jesus three times. He was not only defined by his relationship with Jesus, but he was also defined by his fears. Judas was not only defined by his relationship with Jesus, but also with his attachment to worldly things and ambitions. Jesus was not the Messiah he was envisioning. 
Can we relate to Peter? Do we ever let our fears define us and drive us and our actions and our daily lives? I know I can at times. That's why prayer is a must. Prayer is, is a must for daily thing so that we can surrender our fears. Jesus, that's why Jesus said, do not be afraid. And then focus on him being the solitary love of our life. That's a daily yes that's needed to release the power of the resurrection in our daily life. Can we relate to Judas, with Judas, right? Do we ever try to mold our relationship with Jesus and try to make him out some, as something he's not? Something that we want to be malleable to our own image and likeness. Something that uh, goes along with my desires, my schedule, my wants. These hang-ups that come from having competing loyalties where God is only one of many things in our life that drive and define us, that led Peter and Judas down dark paths. But Peter know, shows us that those bad choices don't have to determine us, that God invites us to repentance and healing and salvation, which we, as we've been seeing in Acts, it frees us to do great things that give God glory and help lead others to their own redemption. And that was made possible by the resurrection and Pentecost with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter no longer had competing loyalties in his life. And so uh, in one pre-resurrection, he was scared to even admit he knew Jesus to a servant girl to now confronting the powers of the world boldly and courageously professing the good news of Jesus Christ because his solitary love of God, his love of God was now solitary and it freed him to serve his neighbor and to, and to glorify God. And when we don't have competing loyalties, we're less likely to fall in the trap of, a fa of following a false God of our own making, which is what the second reading warns us about, right? As the second reading reminds us, quote, the way we can be sure that we know Jesus is to keep his commandments. Those who say, I know him, but do not keep his commandments are liars, and the truth is not in them. So we can be tempted, right? I'm tempted. We can be tempted to follow, to fashion Jesus in our own likeness and image so that living out the gospel doesn't have to make any demands upon us. But when we do that, we make ourselves out to be God, not Jesus. I mean, we can do that in, in our relationships, right? Live it in a way that it doesn't make demands upon us, but then it becomes a lifeless relationship. So John reminds us of the, the other side of that, the good news. He says, but whoever keeps God's word, the love of God is truly perfected in him. Does that intrigue you? Does that make you desirous that God's love is perfected in you? Or do we kind of shy away from it? Because, you know, I don't want to go all in. But then we have all these competing loyalties and a fragmented life. Now, the, the one thing I want to uh, say, that one final thing about what I really enjoyed about the master's experience, there's a very strict rule in the master's. There are no cell phones allowed on the premises Right When you get to the gates, there's these metal detectors and you have to empty out your pockets. If you look suspicious like me, you get wanded and questioned. Right? They even have these canine units and FBI agents around. And there was a little inside joke because out of our entire group, the canine just approached me and sniffed me out. Right? But anyway, it's one of those few places in the world where 40,000 people are gathered in one place each day and has no, no one has a cell phone. If you need to get a hold of someone, there are a couple of areas with rows of courtesy phone booths so you can call your ride or whatever. But uh, this Catholic doctor that I met at the airport uh, whose clients are professional golfers, uh, he, um, he and I were talking we just because we got used to not having phones and we were actually interacting with other people. Wow. <laughs> but we were just marveling uh, about, like he said, it was like a little bit of heaven on earth. Like everyone was present, smiling, interacting with, the, with others, living in the moment, 
as opposed to like like with shoulders down and just going like this. The whole everybody was like uh, interacting with what's going on, on on the course and one another. But uh, we just uh, as as a uh, little thing about what does it look like to have God define us? It means living out our daily lives uh, in light of that, and uh, and so. One of the things that can either serve that or enslave us in the opposite way is our interaction with our devices, right? And so perhaps maybe make some rules like no phones at the dinner table or keeping phones from the bedroom after a specific time. And, you know, lock them up while they're charging and don't pick them up until after your morning prayers so that you're discerning God's will and envisioning your day joyfully fulfilling that, that will for, that God has for you that day, right? Allow God to define you, not the world to define you uh, by you being a reactive robot, but proactively shape it through your prayer life of envisioning what life would look like that day if you were to live out God's will for your, and purpose for your life. And so I, I just end with that. What defines you? Because God awaits your answer here before his altar. And he offers himself to you fully, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Will we offer everything of us to him? Part of God being our solitary love is, first of all, obviously believing in him. And so we have the opportunity to profess our faith in him with the Apostles' Creed that we can find on page 9. And so let's rise with, and declare our faith before God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. We offer to God now our prayer of the faithful. And in Easter time, uh, in response to Lord in your glory, we continue to say, hear our prayer. For the church in the Easter season, may we leave all our fears inside the tomb, stepping out into resurrect resurrected life with Jesus. Lord, in your glory. Hear our prayer. That God will open the eyes of the civil leaders of the world to see the dignity of each individual person placed within their care. Lord, in your glory. Hear our prayer. For those who live with poverty and pain, for those suffering with bitterness and loneliness, and for those who battle hopelessness, we pray the Holy Spirit gladdens their hearts and shows them the way to new life. Lord, in your glory. Hear our prayer. We implore Almighty God for the supernatural end of war, relief for those who are afflicted, and eternal salvation for those whom the Lord has called to himself. Lord, in your glory. May every family of St. John's and St. Joseph who have fallen away from Mass find their way home to Jesus in his sacraments. May those of us gathered here today invite and encourage their return. Lord, in your glory. Hear our prayer. 
for all the intentions of our parishioners as we conduct our intercessory prayer outreach. Lord, in your glory. Hear our prayer. For those who are ill, especially Judy Bell, Suzette McCaig, Sam Fonseca, Craig Hutchinson, Bob Geddens, Bob Thomas, and Cam Reagan. May God call them to new beginnings and send them grace. Lord, in your glory. Hear our prayer. For those who have died, may they fully embrace by the wonders of heaven, especially Florence Callahan and James Sauter. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for Leon Ben, third anniversary, and Steve Ben, for whom this Mass is being offered, Lord, in your glory. Hear our prayer. And let us take a few moments of silence to offer to God our personal intentions for this Mass. Lord, in your glory. Hear our prayer. Loving Father, give us the grace to desire uh, for you to be our solitary love so that uh, we might rightly order all our other loves in our life. Uh, and we ask this prayer through Christ our Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. For as long as I live, I will sing praise to my God. Alleluia. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. For as long as I live, I will sing praise to my God. Alleluia. Offertory hymn is number 361. The morn had spread her crimson rays, number 361 in the source and summit.
pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Receive, O Lord, we pray, these offerings of your exultant church, and as you have given her cause for such great gladness, grant also that the things we bring, the gifts we bring, may bear fruit in perpetual happiness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation at all times to acclaim you, O Lord, but in this time, above all, to laud you yet more gloriously when Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. He never ceases to offer himself for us, but defends us and ever pleads our cause before you. He is the sacrificial victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exalts in your praise and even the heavenly powers with the angelic host sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying... Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, and Earl, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who will please you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours 
forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. Graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's offer each other the sign of peace. Behold, the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. May the body of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. The disciples recognized the Lord Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Alleluia. The disciples recognized the Lord Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Stronghold of my 
during Holy Communion is number 197 in your source and summit. Godhead here in hiding, number 197.
Let us pray. Look with kindness upon your people, O Lord, and grant, we pray, that those you are pleased to renew by eternal mysteries may attain in their flesh the incorruptible glory of the resurrection through Christ our Lord. Thank you. All right, announcements. We've got family discipleship. We've got the uh, right after mass at the Paris Center. We also have um, just a reminder to make sure you fill out uh, the survey uh, to next Tuesday. Not this Tuesday, but the following is the last time you can take the survey. Uh, so please make sure you... Um, the QR code will be projected here shortly. Uh, so as you're walking out of Mass, uh, I want you to uh, flip out your phone, one of the few times you're allowed to do that in church, and, uh, and make sure you get the uh, survey. It's, it's only a dozen questions, very short uh, answers about your Mass time preferences, so as to, to be able to give voice to uh, where you go to Mass, what ideally Mass time you'd like, et cetera. Um, that is, uh, we hope to fulfill not just each household, but everyone, because uh, we want to have the most accurate data possible uh, to make these decisions uh, for our Jackson region. Um, and then um, the, uh, the strong, very strong preference is that you do this online via the QR code or the link that you got in our weekly email. But if you must, uh, and you, you don't know how to do it online, we do have paper copies 
uh, in the vestibule that you can fill out and put in. Uh, but again, only if you must because uh, somebody has to input all those folks, all those surveys manually um, if you don't do it online. And for any those of those who have first graders uh, who want sacraments, uh, particularly uh, perhaps the sacrament of the Eucharist for the first time, First Holy Communion, there's a meeting at 1.15 today. And then there's uh, inserts in the bulletins about our school's uh, race for education. Uh, we invite you to, to the U regional youth encounter uh, coming up. So that's also in the bulletin. And there is the hope and healing prayer team uh, available for anyone who is in need of prayer. Have a great uh, third week of Easter, the Easter season. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Our recessional hymn is in your source in summit number 111. Alleluia, alleluia, let the holy anthem rise, number 111. One, one.